Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Aras Russ Memishezuja. Obviously, when you have that crazy of a name, you have to go by a Nick one, hence why I go by Russ. <laughs> I am the uh, lead cloud architect for the Virginia Cyber Range, and it's my uh, honor and privilege this week to host our uh, weekly workshop on mobile phone and IoT hygiene in 2018 and beyond. A little bit about myself. Um, as I mentioned, I am the uh, lead cloud architect for the Virginia Cyber Range. What that really meant is uh, for about the year and a half that we've been in operation here in the Virginia Cyber Range, uh, I've been able to put together a, uh, an environment that you all are using to be able to teach cybersecurity education throughout the state, uh, thanks to a team of DevOps engineers and full stack developers that I have. Um, I myself, I come from a systems engineering background. For those of you that are IT savvy, uh, I was basically the sysadmin at several academic institutions as well as some private world experiences. Um, I came here to Virginia Tech back in 99 as a cadet, and I kind of worked my way through every and all roles that uh, the university had to offer. For those of you familiar with uh, the uh, Shark Tale um, uh, movie, when the designation of levels of fish, I literally was at the bottom. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to say that uh, having bumped my head around a few times, I've been able to now get to a position where I'm hoping to be able to educate people such as yourselves with cybersecurity topics. Um, I received my bachelor's in computer science from Radford and my master's from here at Virginia Tech in the uh, master's of IT program uh, with my focus in cybersecurity and big data specialization. A little um, housework, if you will. Um, our weekly workshops, as you're all familiar, uh, we do these every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Uh, these are recorded for later viewing. So for those of you that couldn't make it to today's online session, um, our staff will definitely be releasing these on the uh, events page where you can uh, see the listing of our previous workshops as well. We do have a long list of potential topics. Uh, so far, we've covered uh, cryptography. And uh, today, I'll be covering cyber hygiene in the mobile phone and IoT device world. Uh, we would definitely love your suggestions. So if you guys have any particular topic you would like one of our experts here at the range to talk about, we'd be happy to entertain those. So please definitely utilize our form that's also on that events page to suggest any topics that you'd be interested in hearing. And with that, let's go ahead and jump into our this week's topic, which is IoT and mobile phone security. So one of the questions I get asked a lot first is when they hear this IoT three-letter acronym is, what is IoT? Well, IoT is a shortening for Internet of Things. So you guys may be then wondering, who came up with that term? What does that even mean? Um, I prefer to use Wikipedia when it comes to layman level explanations. I know the teachers that are listening in on this who always tell their students Wikipedia is not a proper source. <laughs> I agree with you, but I cannot help but take advantage of some of the ease of communication it does provide from a summarization standpoint. So given that, um, according to Wikipedia's entry, IoT is a network of physical objects, whether these are devices, vehicles, buildings, other items embedded um, that have electronics, software, sensors, and network connectivity capabilities. And these devices specifically collect and exchange data. That, in a nutshell, at a very high 50,000 level overview, is what Internet of Things devices are and what Internet of Things stands for. Then people first hear this and they go, well, so is a smartphone an IoT device? And yes and no. What I mean by that is um, the biggest difference between IoT devices and smartphones is that keyword smart. IoT devices tend to be what we would call dumb devices. What we mean by that is they have very little, if any, pre-programmed logic in them where the whole purpose as the explanation I just um, read earlier to you guys, and you can see as well is to be able to grab the data from one point and push it to point another point, which at then at that point, once the data has traveled to its destination, some background magic, whether that's in the cloud or that's on a particular server, whatever it may be, processes that data and presents it to the consumer in a fashion that they prefer. So for instance, think your Fitbit devices, that would be a great IoT device explanation. But then some of you guys may be saying, well, but what about the Apple Watch? That's also like a Fitbit. And see, that's where the lines start getting blurry. The best distinction that I personally use is, is the device itself has, quote unquote, smartness capabilities. What we mean by that is that you can actually customize the capabilities of the device itself as an end user 
to do what you want it to do, then that may not necessarily be an IoT device. However, it could accomplish the roles and capabilities of an IoT device, which is why we have that little confusion. So then does that mean if I'm treating my IoT devices a certain way, I should treat my smartphone a certain way? No, and that's the beauty of today's topic. I personally myself tend to rank smartphones and IoT devices together when it comes to how I approach them from a data hygiene aspect. Let's talk a little bit about also what data hygiene means. Uh, this is a good reminder here. So what is data hygiene? Data hygiene in 2018 means that we're capable of understanding what exactly we are using from an application, for, I should say from a software or hardware standpoint, and that we are aware of how to control that data. Uh, there have been several uh, privacy-related, um, um, I should say, interactions recently, both at the global scale as well as at our national scale, with how we're choosing to interpret and handle personal data that is collected by devices, which we'll explore here more next. But the hygiene aspect that I'm trying to get across to you as our listener today is to understand that one, I always ask myself this question anytime I'm using any internet device at all. If I have a bullhorn and I scream exactly what I'm typing into my browser, am I going to be comfortable with the fact that people are hearing what I'm essentially typing into the browser? Because what people don't realize is in essence, everything you type into your browser is being broadcasted to everybody globally whether you're using a, a platform such as Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever it may be, or a simple you know, Slack message that you are intending for a small group of people to watch when you don't realize, in fact, it's a much bigger audience. Couple that with the fact that nothing can be deleted from the internet, and then you have the dilemma of the reason behind my question to ask, which is when you type something into a browser, it is pretty much the equivalent of screaming it across the world in a silent manner. So are you comfortable with hearing and seeing what you've inputted into that browser? Now, take browser away, replace it with IoT. Take IoT away, replace it with smartphone. Take smartphone away and replace it with any networked device that can collect and transmit data. Now you have the proper stance that you should be considering when you're interacting with such devices. So a little bit about what IoT's um, uh, hold is like in today's world. Um, as you guys can see as well, uh, currently based on the IoT growth, uh, as has been observed by so sources such as Forbes, um, by 2025, we're expected to have 75 billion IoT devices in production at a consumer as well as manufacturing level. Some of you would be asking, well, why? It's because we love conveniences. I'm sure you guys are watching the uh, commercials for those various big vendors on TV these days when people ask, um, how do I exactly control my oven when I'm not by my oven, but I have to go take care of laundry or some other thing? It is indeed a convenience to be able to get warned by your oven, if you will, that says, hey, I just pre-warmed, or hey, you had said 20 minutes and you have two minutes left. But you also have to consider the implications of that capability, which is part of the reason for our talk today. So if you think about it, how are these devices actually interacting and how are these devices actually penetrating our everyday lives? And that's where we come to this uh, slide of ours, where a picture is worth a thousand words. Unfortunately, uh, in today's world, we have a lot of devices that could be qualified as IoT. In this picture, as you guys are seeing, there is a microphone, there is a lamp, there is a um, vacuum. I'm sure you guys have heard of Roomba. Uh, there are cars, there's bulbs. Uh, anybody heard of the Philips Hue bulb? And you guys don't at first think about this, but when you actually look at this picture and you actually try to think of examples, the more you realize how well saturated we are and we're covered by devices, whether we actually opted in to interact with that device or not, whether we asked actually that device to do what we were hoping it was doing, versus what it's actually doing. These are the concerns that we have to keep in mind when we're pursuing IoT related challenges. Now let's get to some of the problems with IoT devices and why are they even a problem? Well, 
unfortunately, in today's world, uh, as the uh, article I'm referring to here that you guys are looking at uh, says, we've reached the peak of IoT, folks. There's now a smart hairbrush. That is correct. You did not hear me wrong. There is an actual smart hairbrush made by L'Oreal who actually has implemented a microphone into the brush and it quote unquote hears your hair as you're brushing it. Then it gives you on your phone, there's an app you install, which then gives you recommendations on how you should be brushing your hair and recommendations on hair products that could help improve your overall hairstyle. Now, from a business standpoint, this sounds absolute gold. But if you think about it from a physical IoT stance, you realize what a nightmare this device can be. Basically, you're telling people that I'm going to stick a microwave microphone on a brush, that I'm going to have it capable of being connected to a wireless internet that is then going to transmit everything I'm doing over the internet to a cloud-enabled server, where that data is going to be stored potentially forever. So let's assume for a second, I am concerned for my privacy. Well, then I should make sure that such microphone enabled devices aren't around when I'm holding privileged conversations. That's a good thought. Well, the problem is how many people think, is there a microphone in this brush? <laughs> and that comes back to my point with today's talk. It is very hard to distinguish really in today's world between IoT devices and what they are how well they're actually saturated into our everyday lives. So then you start thinking, well, but I mean, okay, isn't there a rule book or something that these guys, these manufacturers are supposed to stick to? In fact, until recently, there really wasn't. What we did have were guidelines. And in this particular case, OASP, one of the uh, well-known uh, open source uh, communities, it stands for the uh, Open Source Web Application Security Project, um, came up with a principles of IoT security where they made some uh, a giant list of recommendations to anybody that's tackling the challenges of IoT to ensure that whatever solution they develop answers these particular topics that they highlighted. And they also give some recommendations on how to do this the right way. But as I said, up until now, these have been only guidelines. There's really no true, uh, at least at the United States level anyway, at our national level, any kind of regulation in place. Although we've been screaming from the top of our lungs as security professionals asking for the US government to help regulate this so that we can enforce some kind of requirement to ensure that the developers of these devices are following best guides and recommendations as made by people that are cybersecurity aware and conscious. Well, you would think that with such recommendations and even if they were not in the United States, that other countries would be doing perhaps better. Well, unfortunately not the case. Looking at some of the worst examples of IoT hacking as of this year, I'm going to go ahead and start from the lowest at the number five, and we'll work our way to the top to the number one. The GPAC. Uh, I'm sure a few of you guys may have been following the uh, internet and TV trends um, a few years back. Uh, Jeep was actually, uh, quote unquote, hacked, uh, where the guy was able to successfully veer off the Jeep, uh, controlling the essentially back door that was left open by the developers of the software at the time. The interesting points to make from that particular experience, Jeep's initial reaction when the security researcher actually documented the problems was to ignore it. And then they tried to actually discredit the security researcher then finally, when the topic itself grabbed enough attention from the media side, that's when Jeep actually chose to work with the researcher to further help them improve the product. So basically what I'm trying to say is the company's first reaction was to say, uh-uh, no such thing happened, when in fact it did, until it got media attention enough where they could no longer just blatantly deny the fact that they were vulnerable and instead switch to a situation where they had to then backtrack and make up for that mistake. Well, what's wrong with this, you're asking? Well, plenty, obviously, but the biggest one being time. For those of you that are familiar with the concept of zero day, uh, zero day is a security concept that uh, stands for when once a vulnerability is identified, 
from the time it's been identified and made public until the time that the vendor that is responsible for that uh, vulnerability is patching actually releases a proper security patch. That time of window is usually called the zero day window. And that is the window of systems engineers slash systems operations slash sysadmins pretty much lose sleep over. Because for that time period, you have no protection against the security vulnerability that's been identified. That's why we have uh, processes such as responsible disclosure, and we have best recommendations on how to interact with companies when reporting such security vulnerabilities. But the reality of the situation is not everybody follows those. And as a result, you end up in situations where these types of attacks are leaked. Hint, hint, Mirai, which we'll be talking about here shortly. Moving on to our number four is the TrendNet webcam hack. So I don't know if those of you that are listening in own any TrendNet routers in your household. These are one of the consumer level routers that anybody can pick up from, you know, your big box store of choice for less than 60, 50 bucks and enables you to be able to wirelessly network your entire house. They're so easy. As a matter of fact, all you have to do is just pull it out of the box, plug it in and boom, everything is just working. Well, again, think about that for a second. These are, at the end of the day, as I explained, smart devices, which means that they have some kind of software that's running this particular capability you're trying to take advantage of. Well, how is it that they know how to set themselves up? It just really means that some software developer actually set up what we would call a default template in a way such that when the device is powered on, it is capable of providing surface for whatever it is that it was designed to do at a, what we would call default level. The problem ends up becoming most consumers either don't know or don't care on how to properly configure that device. So you end up with a plethora of devices that are deployed in their default mode with default username and password that are publicly accessible by the whole world. So when you think about it from that sense, of course, the first thing you're going is, uh, where's that box? I need to go and unplug it now. <laughs> which I recommend you guys do, by the way. Um, but I don't mean, you know, disable your home networking. But what I do mean is definitely be aware of the potential issues with default configuration deployed devices. So what can you do about this? Well, in this particular case, you should not be leaving your device in its default configuration mode. Even when you open that little booklet that nobody reads, one of the very few steps in there, the first ones, is actually it says, do not leave this device in its default configuration mode. That is because even the manufacturer themselves uh, identify and realize that, in fact, this could be a potential security problem. Unfortunately, the people that actually listen to this in today's world, per statistics that we have access to, Around 80% don't care, which is why we're hoping today's workly, uh, weekly workshop will help us actually improve on that statistics. So we'll be able to lower it down further so more of you guys care. And hopefully you as the instructor are able to pass this knowledge on to your students who then can do you know, the passing forward option so we can hopefully help as a nation work on reducing that ignorance. Let's move on to step number three or hack number three. Well, the Owlet Wi-Fi Baby Heart Monitor. Folks, this one was a scary one. So uh, for those of you that may not be familiar, this was a device that was designed for babies uh, to actually wear as a sock. The concept is that it'll keep track of the baby's heart uh, rate. And if anything happened that somehow stopped the transmission of that information, the parent will be notified. Again, in theory, sounds like a great device. This is something we should use. It would help with, you know, crib death syndrome and all these other problems that we have. The more we monitor, the better we are at understanding our health. So this is all great ideas. Well, again, what came to be the problem in this particular implementation that led to the hack that it did was the way that we chose to implement the idea. Remember my mentioning the OAS principles and us, you know, actually security guys trying to help people develop, develop good software. Unfortunately, this is an example that clearly shows when a vendor chooses to ignore these recommendations and they implement their own thing for whatever the way that they chose to do it in, you can end up with situations like this. As one of my big brothers slash masters always says, 
always question somebody's secret sauce because chances are there's really no reason for a secret sauce. In fact, that is quite true. If you are sort of those of you that have actually already followed uh, Dr. Amen's crypto uh, lab from earlier, uh, or if you've actually taken that in the range, you guys will realize that we have some very well mathematically proven uh, crypto capabilities easily available for free to anybody that wishes to implement them. When that is already the case, why try to invent your own? Is it to ensure that nobody but me gets in? Well, the problem is most of these algorithms have had years of research and study done on them. They've been peer reviewed, blind studies, double blind studies. And in each case, every time the result has always proven that the algorithm was infallible. Now, I'm not gonna go into whole quantum level crypto and Shor's algorithm and all that. That's a discussion for another time. But if you already have a well-proven working method, why mess with it? Why try to add vulnerabilities that you don't understand? And in this particular case with Owlet, I'm not saying that they wrote their own crypto, but what they chose to actually do was in fact implement no crypto. So what was actually happening was the information that was being relayed from the device in that sock to the phone, in fact, was clearly visible, publicly speaking, and even worse, the so-called monitor actually set up a open, wide network for anybody to be able to listen in on its conversation with the app. What the other issues that the security researchers also identified was that, in fact, when you do attack such devices and you do get into it, the software doesn't revert back. So the issue was, most of the time, we all know babies, they don't really you know, sit still or anything, and such socks, sometimes they fall off, right? So as the parent, you know, so you would get a notice on your app that said, oh, there's something wrong, we're not receiving data. And you would walk into the room and realize the sock had fallen off and you just put the sock back on. Well, if you don't go back to the app and hit the reset button for it to start listening in again, it never did listen. And the warning didn't trigger back up again either. So as far as the parent's concerned, now not only are they not aware of what's going on with their baby, but as far as they're aware, they went ahead and corrected the problem. So you see, once again, an educational issue causes for the consumer to end up exposing themselves in ways that could potentially be quite devastating, all for the sake of making a few bucks and not thinking through the product itself by the manufacturer. That's really the issue that we're trying to save, that we're trying to fight in today's world. One, educate our consumers so that they're aware of problems that could arise from purchasing such an IoT device, but also trying to tell the manufacturers themselves to do a better job on implementing cybersecurity or ensuring that they actually ask the question, should we be doing that? And that's what we all need to do to be able to hopefully improve on this problem of ours with IoT. So you look at these and you say to yourself, well, so then what are the common uh, vectors, Russ? Is there anything that has kind of come up? Rapid7, one of the very famous cybersecurity research companies out there, has actually done some research specifically into IoT. Uh, they actually chose to attack uh, particularly baby monitors because the other concern with baby monitors is that as a parent, you want to make sure you're capable of hearing and listening in on your child's uh, well-being. So therefore, you make sure this thing is hooked online and it's capable and it's not going to drop off. You give it the best internet, best day, everything. And usually, it's also placed in a very sensitive area in the house to make sure that you can hear and observe if any issues happen. Well, think of that from a cybersecurity sense for a second. If I'm trying to go after a particular mark or a target and I want to listen in on their home conversations, what better way than to go after a very low hanging fruit, in this case, a baby monitor that's been implemented to not include any cryptology, any authentication mechanism whatsoever. And I can simply just with a few taps on my browser, hop on and actually start observing and listening in on the family and what they're doing. And thanks to the family's obsession of making sure that they want to listen to their baby, I have pretty much guaranteed access 24 seven into your house. Because if there's ever a problem with the monitor, the first thing the parent does is goes and resets it to make sure that they can continue to see it. See the issue? Well, I'm obviously not the only one to bring this to everybody's attention. As I mentioned, Rapid7 has also done this research. So if you guys look on the uh, slides here, you'll see that a 
pattern starts to emerge. And the pattern here in this particular case is, in fact, this particular baby monitor maker is not the only one. Uh, quite a lot of them don't uh, tend to implement any kind of cryptology or authentication authorization mechanism. Make it even worse, you, they don't even do it when the device itself is communicating directly with the cloud. To make matters even worse, er, they don't encrypt the data on the disk itself that is being recorded on. So what I mean by that is, those of you that have Alexa or uh, Siri or similar, um, I would say, voice assistive technologies, uh, if you've ever followed the news uh, regarding these devices, you will have known that recently uh, Amazon's Alexa was actually in a uh, legal dispute where the local uh, Leos sent in a request to Amazon asking to have access to the recordings of the Alexa device for the past 48 hours of it. Amazon's response back to the uh, local enforcement officers was uh, actually quite intriguing. While they did not deny that they did not have access to the data, they just said, by law, they cannot produce such data. Which tells you, in fact, these devices are recording. Well, and again, this is why I try to tell people common logic is unfortunate. Common sense is not so common anymore. You have to think about it again from a computing standpoint. What is an Alexa device? What is a Siri device? These are computers that have been programmed to wait for certain triggers and based on those triggers take certain actions so in short it is a computing device that is taking automatic actions based on words you're saying well how is this device knowing uh, is capable of knowing what you're saying it has a microphone well how does it know when to actually listen when you say siri and when does it know not to listen when you say uh, you know when you don't say the the trigger word alexa siri okay google whatever the answer is it doesn't. What the device manufacturers tell you is they don't store that data. They only start processing once they hear their trigger. But at the end of the day, you are at least confirming simply by logic. I have not cracked open a single device as of yet to uh, for what I'm making the claim of. And I can tell you that this device is in fact recording any and all audio that it does have access to. So coming back to here with the common vulnerability, if I'm not even encrypting that, well, imagine what happens if I have access to that device. Now I have access to recordings going back as far as the storage can allow. So now I have access to a device coming back to the baby monitor or Alexa or Siri or whatever. Now I have access to a media streaming device that has recordings going back two days that I can easily access and do whatever I'd like. And all because I wanted to make sure my baby's well-being was being monitored properly so that I don't have to worry about it challenges of IoT and technology. Another big problem, and this is actually what, uh, again, going back to our five worst examples that I'm covering here, uh, is the fact that most manufacturers tend to leave their quote unquote debug methods open after the fact. So in the manufacturing world, when you're developing a device, whether this is hardware or software, whether this is an application or it's a service, whatever it may be, well, at the development stage, you tend to put in some hooks, some shims. If you think about it from a car mechanic standpoint, you leave the hood open and easily accessible as the car is being developed and it's running. So you as the mechanic slash engineer slash architect slash whatever can ensure you, your design is implemented and the patterns that you expected to appear are appearing as you expect it to be. Well, a little bit fast forward, we're supposed to, once you've pushed a product and it's passed all of its quality checks, and all of its assurance and all of its comp uh, compliance factors, everything has been, all the I's have been dotted, the T's have been crossed, you expect this access to be removed. Unfortunately, manufacturers don't really do a good job of cleaning up after themselves and they tend to leave those open as well. In this particular case, this uh, one particular router was notorious for being easily accessible as long as you knew what the IP of it was, you could access a shell, a remote shell for that router that gave you full access. You got to log in with what's known as root, which is the pretty much um, level zero, you know, closest, best full access level you could possibly gain from a hardware or software level stance. 
Another issue that it plagues IoT devices is backdoor accounts. Backdoor accounts are basically local accounts that were implemented for usually testing purposes. So they'll have things, names like debug or sample one or testing X factor, whatever it is that they're looking at. And usually the password will be something like password, password or admin password or default. The reason for these is from an automation standpoint, when we're developing software, we want to have a certain set of different things that we're testing for to make sure that the software itself can produce the result we're looking for. Well, when you look at it from that stance, you realize you need all these tests in place. Well, you need the device to be able to respond to those tests in the manner you're looking. So that's why you add fixed, built-in, easy to guess username and passwords. Again, however, once the development is done and you go to production, these types of things should be removed from the final product. Again, coming back, most manufacturers sadly never paid attention to these because they were so focused on rushing the device out the door, they did not actually pay attention to the biggest problem, which was, hmm, I wonder if somebody can get into this in a way I didn't intend them to. And finally, as I always say, uh, with regards to cybersecurity in general, if you have physical access to a device, it's game over. This holds true regardless if this is an IoT device or if this is a uh, smartphone or if this is a laptop or if this is a computer, if this is a kiosk, it doesn't matter. If you have physical access to a device, there is a 99.9% .9 chance you can bypass any and all uh, limitations that are placed on that device. Now, sure, I did say 99.9, .9, so you're saying, Russ, there is one that cannot be hacked. Well, yes, no, sort of. There are ways. At the end of the day, cybersecurity, from a concept standpoint, one of the things I personally follow is its defense in depth concept. Defense in depth basically says you don't rely on one method. You rely on a multitude of methods to protect your asset. Whatever it is that you're trying to ensure is not going to be accessed in an unauthorized manner. So in this particular case, you wouldn't just rely on a single firewall or you wouldn't just rely on a single um, you know, USB device. So there are additional layers of protection you can implement to make it difficult for the attacker to be able to do things to the device. But again, 99.99% .99 of the time, if you have physical device access, you can bypass any limitations that may be put in place by the manufacturer. And now you get to run that software in a way the manufacturer didn't intend to. So to summarize these, I would say the TLDR, that if you will, as again, one of my big brothers, uh, Mr. Monte Elkins, who is the uh, hacker in chief for FoxGuard uh, here, a local uh, hardware cybersecurity uh, solutions uh, company uh, states as well, uh, hardware equals firmware equals software. What that means is in the past, we used to only have to worry about software because, well, it was software that was being uh, written by humans and it was software that had to be the one that had to be corrected or adjusted to prevent whatever outcome it was that was observed. Coming back to IoT devices, coming back to cloud, coming back to virtualization, these lines have begun to blur now. What we would consider firmware, which is really software for the hardware, is now as easily updatable as software itself. And coming back to these challenges that I covered with IoT devices, you end up realizing that, hmm, maybe I should be updating my IoT device. But think about that for a second. Then does that mean I should be updating my air conditioning unit? I should be updating my vacuum? Actually, yes. That is what you should be doing as the consumer. Because if you actually go back to that manufacturer's website that you bought that product, I can assure you, if it is an internet-enabled device, chances are there has been an update to its firmware since your purchase. One of the best ways to confirm this would be if you have a quote-unquote smart connected TV, plug it into the internet. One of the very first things that you're going to get as a notice is that, hey, there's a software update. Would you like to update your TV? For a second, you kind of giggle for those of us that have been around for a bit in the internet world, and you're going, wait, I'm going to update my TV? What is it going to do? But what it could be doing is turning on devices, turning off devices, focusing on what these devices can and cannot do, which could or could not, <laughs> depending on whatever the intention is, 
prevent or add and exacerbate the problem that you're trying to prevent. So you as the consumer, do you have any idea of if this patch that you're downloading is doing the right thing? Well, that's where it kind of gets into, again, user education and Google really is what I would say, or I should really preface that and say your favorite web search tool. But you should be asking these questions, not just for IoT devices, but for phones as well. The issue I have most faced in today's world with regards to cybersecurity education when it comes to mobile phone handling has been the disinterest in understanding the security mechanisms behind smartphones. What I mean by this is, yes, smartphones try to tackle the problem of authorization and authentication by preventing the default implementation of such as default user access or default user uh, name passwords and so on and so forth. Instead, they pass the burden to the user by prompting them with questions such as, uh, Amazon would like camera access or Facebook Messenger would like access to these things. Now, here's the problem. You're a kid, you're 12, 13 years old, and all of your friends are accessing this one particular app. Oh, it's, uh, I don't know, uh, Facebook Messenger. Oh, it's Viber. Oh, it's Skype. Oh, it's, you know, um, uh, WhatsApp, whatever it may be. You know, you could t take your uh, pick, uh, you know, app du jour of a uh, plethora of things that the kids are using these days. Now, if you didn't educate them on actually what it means to click that accept button or that OK button, well, then how can you blame them when the consequences of that action end up hurting them? So then you're asking, well, how are we supposed to know, Russ? Simple, Google it. So in this particular case, I opened up my favorite uh, web search tool and I typed the very question the application itself was asking me. In this particular case, I looked at it said, contacts calendar. I'm like, hmm, I wonder what that means. So I go here and I write, Android contacts and I typed dangerous permission because I don't know if it is or not. Well, what do you know? Lo and behold, the very top hit here has all kinds of interesting listings. And one of them is permissions overview, Android developers, request app permissions, Android developers. Hmm, I wonder what these mean. So you'll click into it. And sure enough, you come across this nice little collection documentation that Android has had publicly available since it's 1.0. That actually on the right hand side here, if I click on dangerous permissions, I'll be able to see on table one, the listing of dangerous permissions. So now I know if something is asking me, should I be saying yes or no to this? What exactly I am giving it yes or no to? So if an application says contacts or calendar, it actually in the Android world means read calendar or write calendar as two separate permission capabilities. If it's contacts, it could be read contacts, write contacts, or get accounts. So you may be wondering, ah, what do those mean? Well, I mean, usually, obviously, with software development, what it says on the tin is what it is. So in this particular case, giving it the permission to read a calendar, you're basically telling that application it has access to your calendar. Now, go back to my original recommendation I made with holding a bullhorn and screaming. Now think for a second. Are you comfortable with screaming your entire calendar through a bullhorn so that everybody can hear? If your answer is yes, so in this case you're a 16 year old, what calendar, right? You know, beyond your academic um, requirements or your academic dependencies, what else do you have? So who cares if it has access to your calendar is what you may be thinking. But if you're a 40, 50 year old business exec who has not only one calendar, but eight calendars and has three admin assistants maintaining those calendars, and you're pretty much Pavlov's dog walking around as your phone dings you do stuff, <laughs> well, then a calendar becomes a problem. So these are the thought patterns that I would like to make sure you guys actually relay to your students and use yourselves. If I scream it from a bullhorn, am I gonna be comfortable with the fact that anybody can hear what this bullhorn is producing? If the answer is no to that, then you pretty much know whether you should be allowing that app or not. But then some of you guys may be wondering, well, I've heard of, you know, particularly people saying that uh, they can actually 
uh, identify whether an app is evil or not, or whether they know how something is acceptable. So for instance, if you actually go onto your phone and you look in the permissions section, you will notice that Google's own built-in apps have access to your location, have access to your files, have access to the internet, have access to your phone, can send texts, can check your location, all kinds of stuff. So you're wondering, hmm, well, I mean, Google did write Android, and I can see this particular service or software that's listed needs access to that permission, so I guess I'll just let it be. How do you know that's actually a Google software? That is a very good question. So that's where we now come to my recommendations here on how do I know if an app is evil? I've been giving this talk uh, now for about two and a half, three years. So these recommendations that I've typed here are a collection of that. As you'll notice, I've actually stricken one through. I didn't delete it. And I've actually listed there, hey, not true anymore for a reason. And that is to show even myself the recommendations I make. Well, guess what? These recommendations, I'm not inventing these. These are just usually common sense vectors, but coupled with some academic knowledge and a lot of bumps on the head that I had to take and get over. <laughs> and you realize all of a sudden, well, somebody else may be thinking that too. So coming back, one of my recommendations used to be check the reviews in Apple's App Store and Google's Play Store. A real app will likely have thousands of hopefully positive reviews, while a fake one will likely have zero. Ah, well. That used to be a very easy and good indicator on whether or not something was some, if some software was something somebody managed to sneak through the quality control process of either Google or, and, uh, or Apple, and they were able to get essentially a evil app through to you as the consumer who was thinking they're installing a flashlight app when in fact it's actually collecting all of their email stats and sending it to some ser server in the cloud that you have no idea of. As far as you were concerned, the app prompted and said, do you want this flashlight app to have internet, internet access? And you went, eh, whatever, just accept, accept. Boom. Now you have any time an app you turned on the flashlight, all of your email data was sent over. Now you're wondering, eh, so what if they have access to my email? If you started noticing a huge increase in your junk mail, that may be one of the reasons for it. So you're saying, eh, I get junk mail all the time. Last year, myself, as a cybersecurity guy, uh, I was attacked. Um, I was essentially email bombed. So one of these uh, guys uh, using a botnet, uh, botnet for those of you that are not familiar with the concept, is a collection of uh, previously um, accessible, uh, easily accessible, uh, non-maintained systems that allow hackers to be able to utilize for whatever means that they are trying to pursue. So for instance, in the case of, uh, say I'm gonna be attacking Microsoft. Well, if I come from a single IP, Microsoft's own uh, evil detection mechanisms can say, eh, we know what that is, we'll just block it. So no matter what they're trying to do, we won't care about that traffic. What if I had access to 50,000 machines? What if I had access to half a million machines? What if I had access to millions of machines? Now you come to botnet. And I'm not doing anything evil, right? I have access to 3 million machines. All I'm doing is go to www.microsoft.com, enter. What just happened now? All 3 million systems that I had access to at the exact same time tried to go to Microsoft.com. Well, look at this from Microsoft security team standpoint. What they're noticing is, well, I mean, it looks like regular web traffic because if you look at it, people are trying to connect to Microsoft.com from all over the world. The only true indicator that this is an attack is that all of them happen at the same time. Now that is, if I was a novice, if I know what I'm doing, I'll even change, I'll do add what we call jitter into the process such that not all of them at the exact same time hit Microsoft, but maybe let's say I give a jitter of five minutes. So three million devices all hit the exact same address within a five minute window. Now I've bypassed their only in one detection that they had with that, uh, this all happened at the same time. Now I keep rinsing and repeating that attack. What do you think is gonna happen to Microsoft.com's web servers? They're not gonna be accessible to anybody else. So what I'm really covering here is the concept of what we call a distributed denial of service attack. 
But unfortunately, the reason how that works is because of botnets. And botnets, sadly, tend to be full of IoT devices because they have wrong or bad or default passwords built into them that give the hacker full level access to the device itself. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and switch to the uh, Mirai here. So coming back to our five worst examples. The Mirai botnet. So for those of you that may have heard of this attack, the biggest um, issue with it was <clears throat> Mirai was designed to leverage IoT by scanning the web for devices protected by factory default passwords or hard-coded credentials, making them easy to compromise and infect. Once under the control of malicious actors, these devices are turned into a kind of massive botnet that can spam DDoS websites and quickly shut them down. Krebs on Security was a site that was attacked, and they had malware reaching 620 gigs per second. Uh, Ars Technica also reported a one terabyte per second attack on French web host OVH. So what does this mean? Basically, somebody sat down and actually wrote this piece of software that all it really did was contained the default username and passwords of a bunch of IoT devices out there. So remember the uh, router coming back to TrendNet, admin password, you know, uh, looking at the Owlet uh, baby monitor, the default username and password in that one was also easily accessible, and there was no crypto. So what the Mirai and tools like Mirai do is they basically just go online and they start scanning for, hey, I'm wondering, is there a web server that claims to have the name Owlet? Or is there a web server that claims to have the name TrendNet? And from there, I can start attacking those devices and using them as a jump point. So now I have a foothold in Japan that I can actually have it and go and ping Microsoft.com or try to access Microsoft.com. And it's somebody's router. That person that actually owns that router has no idea I'm even doing this. Because I have full level access to the device, one of the first things I can do is hide myself. So then you're thinking, oh my God, so there's no protection from any of this? Well, there is. Thinking about what it is that you're implementing and why you're implementing it. Hence why I call this cybersecurity hygiene. At the end of the day, you as the consumer have to make the right choice. And how do you make that choice unless you're actually informed? So now I'm going to switch over to a little about what I do with regards to demos uh, when it comes to these types of talks. In the past, when I've ever given this talk, I usually do a demo where I actually demonstrate on my own phone how easy it is to hack into it and not even let the end user know that it's been hacked. The problem with that approach was, well, once, of course, the initial shock has worn off and people understand how easy it is to get into these types of smartphone and other devices, they immediately go, oh, well, you know, Russ, at least it's people like you who are cybersecurity focused, so it's, it's, it's really a less amount of people. You know, it's only that 1% that I have to worry about. And hey, who am I? I'm just a small fish. Nobody's going to come after me. I'm safe. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, unfortunately, that's not really the case. Um, there are some now commercially available, and I would say less than $30. Uh, you can buy the very service that the very demonstration I did as a service now. In this particular case, uh, there are two such companies that provide software that I'm gonna show here on what actually is done on the end user side that it demonstrates this capability that you guys see here on the screen. So as you guys can see here, as I had mentioned, I'll stop it right here. If I want to sneakily install a software on a smartphone, well, there has to be a mechanism for me to bypass so I can install the software in it. That in the Android world is tricky thanks to Android's developer uh, list, as I had mentioned, where they categorize quote unquote dangerous permissions and ensure that the user has to click yes for that to be enabled and granted to an application. Now that we have these two pieces of facts, let's look at it for a second. So let's say I'm trying to attack a phone that has no root. Well, then what do I do? I need to trick the user into thinking that it's okay for them to grant me the permission to be able to essentially destroy the device. That's what this particular piece of software is doing. The software calls itself system service. 
actually has the standard Android icon. And it's asking for things that, well, if you were actually looking at it, you would go, yeah, it's a system service. It should have access to my SD card and find the accounts and change network activity. It's a system service. That should make sense. So even if you went on your phone and you actually looked at permissions and you said, hmm, I wonder who has location access on my phone, and you saw something that's listed as system service, are you going to question it twice? What I'm hoping you do after this is yes, you do question it twice, twice. You actually log into it and you look at its details. That's where the magic is. If you look at the details and you notice, huh, this application wasn't signed or wasn't developed by the person or entity claiming to have developed it, that's your answer right there that you should not be granting access to this application. Now, that being said, how many people actually do that? Unfortunately, not enough. So let's continue on with our video here. In this particular case, despite all these scary permissions that even Android themselves qualifies as dangerous, user clicks install. Well, at that point, it's pretty much game over. Now this person, if I'm fishing, has, oh, I've hooked them, and I'm now gratefully, and thanks to their permission, in their system to do whatever it is that I would like to do. So if this is an Android device or this is an iPhone device, I now have full, quote unquote, developer level access to it itself. So what happens from here? Basically, at this point, then the user actually, oh, this is one more thing I, knew I wanted to show you guys. The app itself has also a added really cool feature where it will actually hide itself. So let's demonstrate that here. What the user does is after they've installed the software and they've configured it, they simply click a button, hide icon. So now, not only is an evil piece of software that I've allowed it to be installed on devices installed, now I have no way of identifying it even if I went into apps. And as the user, that's about all I'm allowed to do. I'm not expected by Android to be a knowing, knowing all about the Android operating system intricacies and having access to all the tools and tips that they, those uh, capabilities offer. I'm just an end user. My job is to click buttons and make things work and hopefully also use it as a device, you know, as a phone as it was originally intended. If I'm hiding the app icon now even from the user when I'm installing it, imagine what could go wrong. So you know how these magicians recently that you're watching, or I don't know if you have seen, they're doing now what they're calling smartphone magic? Essentially, that is what this is. What they're doing is installing this piece of software and then hiding the app, and then they're going back, and they're able, or whether their assistant does it or not, they're able to access everything that device has. So let me show you what I mean by that. So in this particular case, this vendor actually has uh, allowed and enabled if you are on the free plan to have access to the GPS history, all the text messages, the call history, as well as to be able to turn on or off the auto answer capability of the phone. If you've paid them at the gold level, you get access to the um, notification history, the notes history, the video history, the voice memos, um, the key logger history. Oh, that's a cute one. So this software developer themselves has actually written a key logger and it actually installs itself in the back end through that system service that you guys just saw. So anything and everything that's typed into the phone will come to you as the observer in a nice little blurb saying this person typed this at this hour, then this at this hour, then this, this, this at this hour. Moving forward, you can also access the Yahoo Hangouts, um, uh, WhatsApp, Viber, Skype, Facebook. Another thing this particular vendor touts is that they have access to deciphering 32 different applications. In other words, what they're really doing is they're reverse engineering the capability of the software to read in at the user permission level what has been entered into that application. So as a result, now for only a few dollars a month, I simply need to get this one application onto either an iPhone or an Android and I, as the observer, have full access to anything with the click of a button. So if I click location, as you guys see here, pops up a nice little GPS for me and shows me where exactly that device is. If I click messages, SMS, I'd actually see all the SMS content. So what's the moral of the story? Pay attention to permissions, folks. Understand that even 
Google is trying to help you by putting this information out there in the public. Ignorance is no longer a reason to say, I'm safe. We, as the intelligent, informed consumers of electronics in 2018, need to do a better job on educating ourselves. And one of the best tools that are available to us as researchers are web search engines. And it's through those that I've been able to put together today's presentation for you all. I'm hoping this was a uh, good session. And uh, at this point, I will go ahead and turn it over to questions. If you do have any questions, please feel free to type them in the window and I will address them. For those of you that are asking, are there any safe applications? Um, there are, right? As I explained earlier, um, some operating systems tend to come with some default applications. You can easily Google what those are and actually figure out, oh, does this belong to Apple or does this belong to Google itself? But also, as I mentioned, one of the best ways to ensure the application is actually written by the person or persons claiming to have written that software is to look at the application's detail itself. If you actually Google Android, how to look at app details, <clears throat> you'll actually be able to find um, the links with that tutorials that help you demonstrate what those are. And if you guys do have any questions after this talk, please feel free to contact us. We have our Twitter, obviously, at VA Cyber Range. And my email address is right here. Uh, it's uh, russ at virginiacyberrange.org. I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys may have with regards to this. And I'm also always interested in your comments and input. If you have any suggestions that I can add into here, so for instance, I would love to hear any uh, security faux pas that may have happened because students didn't actually follow the points that I made here today to you all. I would love to hear that. I would love to be able to add it to this presentation as we go forward. Unless there's any other questions, at this point I'll go ahead and uh, conclude this week's talk. I hope it was uh, useful to you. And again, I look forward to hearing from you with any of your input and comment. Thank you so much for your time.